Good evening. In October of last year, I went to see a friend in Loughborough, and we uh, decided to go to Leicester Cathedral to see uh, uh, the Richard III exhibition. We also had a look around the cathedral as well. I was struck by the prayers they displayed for people to echo in their own thoughts and hearts. Last year was a year of tension and uncertainty, and since the last council meeting, there has been, of course, a general election. The need for reconciliation and healing is still re relevant, so I've, I borrowed the prayers from Leicester Cathedral, which are just as relevant for this time, this evening, as tendering district council meets. With a slight tweak, I share them with you for our community and our nation at this time. God of reconciling hope, as you guided your people in the past, guide us through the turmoil of the present and bring us to that place of flourishing where our unity can be restored, the common good served, and all shall be made well. God of wisdom and strength, who challenges us in our foolishness and supports us in our weakness, give to those who lead us in this nation and this community of Tendring District. Give to them a desire for that which is best, a commitment to that which is honourable, a love for what is true, and a passion to serve the common good. In the name of Jesus Christ we ask this. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, good evening, members, uh, officers, and good evening, members of the public. Thank you for turning out on what is an extremely cold evening. Thank you. Um, this, of course, is the first meeting of the year, and indeed the first meeting of the decade. Um, and my apologies that the first meeting will be chaired by me, our chairman, not being available this evening. Um, I will do my best, um, but be gentle. It's my first time. Okay, moving swiftly on. Um, item one, apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chairman. I have apologies for absence for Councillor Land and Councillor Cawthron. Thank you. Thank you. Item two, minutes of the last meeting of the Council. They can be found on pages one to 18. All okay? Okay, thank you. Item three, uh, declarations of interest. Just as a quick note, uh, as a guidance to everybody, in relation to item, when I can find it, there it is, item 18, there is a blanket dispensation, as I understand it, for all members, so there's no need to declare an interest for item 18. Are there any other declarations of interest, please? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Excellent. Uh, item four, announcements by Chairman of the Council. Um, I have nothing from Daniel, and as Vice Chairman, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do anything, so I will not. Uh, item five, announcements by the Chief Executive. There are none. Item six, this is going well. Statements by the Leader of the Council. Uh, Leader of the Council, Councillor Stock. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll, I'll be quite brief. In fact, I, I was going to mention uh, the general election. I was kind of beaten to it by the vicar, um, which is a bit of a first. But nevertheless, um, as he rightly pointed out, we did indeed have um, a general election just over a month ago on the 12th of December. And uh, in the spirit of reconciliation to which the vicar referred, I'm not going to comment on the, the result or, or what's happening at the end of this month. Um, but I did want to comment on the um, mechanisms and uh, the work that goes into the election itself. And I wanted to thank and congratulate, really, all our officers and staff who were involved in that election, from our um, acting returning officer all the way down through the entire team, to those presiding officers who sit at polling stations and they have to sit there from 6 a.m.? No, 7 a.m. Uh, to 10 p.m. But they obviously have to get there early to set everything up. And that can't always be the most exciting of jobs. And they have to be diligent and vigilant and, and stay at their posts at all the dozens and dozens of polling stations across the district. And then after that, all the votes have to be counted. 
So I'd like to thank all our staff, and I'd also like to extend that thanks to Culture to Borough Council, who, uh, as members will probably also be aware, dealt with the uh, parliamentary constituency of Howard and North Essex, which covers about, uh, well, I don't know, what, a third of this district, um, the, the northern bit, and the bit where I live, and so many of us would have, would have voted and, and been living in that part of the constituency and that part of the district. So thanks, Colchester, and all the work they did, and thanks to Tony and all the work they did. And on a um, slightly different note, whilst I'm on my feet, I thought um, this would be a superb opportunity, Chairman, with your indulgence, um, to, to thoroughly embarrass the Chief Executive, because I understand he has a, um, a significant birthday this week, and I, <laughs> I, I think it would be a cruel and unreasonable punishment if we actually <laughs> sung happy birthday to him, but I just thought members would probably like to uh, wish him happy birthday with a, with a small round of applause. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Nicely done. Uh, okay. Item seven. Uh, statements by a member of the Cabinet. I have none here. I believe that's correct. Moving then to item eight, petitions to Council. There are none. Um, so straight on then to item nine, questions pursuant to Council Procedure Rule 10.1. There are three such questions this evening, and they can be found on page 19 of your agenda. Uh, so the first question is from Steve Kelly to Councillor Neil Stock. Um, Mr Kelly, could I ask you to come forward, please, and take a seat at the table? I believe you've done this before, but if you'd like to just press the little button until it glows red, that's the one. And uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Given that the scientific research suggests that tipping points are making the climate crisis irretrievably apocalyptic, how can the Council best prepare for, for the uh, extreme food insecurity and mass migration both to and from our district due to the climate crisis emergencies? Thank you. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Councillor Stock. Mr Kelly, could you? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman, and um, thank you for your question, Mr Kelly. Uh, the issues of the environment generally, and climate change in particular, are matters that this Council take very seriously. Indeed, we were one of the first local authorities to declare a climate emergency. Well, following that decision, I set up a cross-party member-led climate change working group. Through that group, we have commissioned the Association of Public Service Excellence to work with us to establish our own carbon footprint and to prepare an action plan setting out how we can become carbon neutral by 2030. Through the data that we collect and the action plan that will be developed, we will have a clear indication of the work that we need to undertake to become carbon neutral and the measures we need to take to encourage our residents and businesses to take action alongside us to tackle these important issues as well as any other issues arising such as those you refer to in your question. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Uh, thank you, Mr Kelly, if you could retake your seat. Thank you. Uh, the second question uh, this evening is from Chris Southall to Councillor Neil Stock. Um, Mr Southall, I think you've probably done this before as well, haven't you? You haven't? Okay. If you could just take a seat, get yourself comfortable, switch the microphone on. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The measures needed to reduce fuel use are well known. Property, prop, property insulation, solar panels, electric vehicles for example. The expertise to assess the changes needed already exist in tendering, for, exa for example, trained EPC energy assessors who go Stop. into uh, buildings to assess their energy level. Given the urgency of taking immediate action on the climate crisis, there are obvious measures that need to be taken immediately. So this is my question. How can the Climate Emergency Working Group justify the huge amount of money set aside, £150,000, I believe they haven't spent all of that so far, that's £150,000, a large part of it committed to an outside agency, when the same amount of money would go a long way towards providing much needed, the much needed insulation and renewable energy and do renewable energy generation investment on council properties. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Southall. Councillor Stock. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, thank you for your question, Mr. Southall. Um, the Council declared a climate emergency in August last year, and on the back of that, I set up a cross party member led uh, working group tasked with preparing an action plan setting out how we will become carbon neutral by 2030. Before the Council commits to a programme of energy efficiency improvements or other measures aimed at reducing our carbon footprint, we must ensure that we are committing to do the right things. If we are not sure, then we could be wasting taxpayers' money and not making any meaningful difference. <coughs> to provide us with expert advice and to make sure we are making the best use of our resources, we have commissioned the Association of Public Service Excellence, APSI. Their team brings to us significant expertise and experience in this field that we simply do not have available in-house. I can assure you that even though they have only recently started working with us, it is clear that this money, £35,000, is being very well spent and actually not a huge amount of money considering the sums we may need to invest to reduce our carbon emissions and to achieve our target of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Thank you, Mr Southall. Thank you. Uh, question three this evening uh, from Richard Everett to Councillor Neil Stock. Uh, Mr Everett, I'm absolutely certain you know how to do that, so I shall leave it with you. Uh, it's over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Last year, the Council took a number of cases to a planning public inquiry with the expressed intention of eliciting guidance from the Planning Inspectorate to gain consistency over the occupancy of chalets in Point Clear. Just before Christmas, a planning inspector issued her decisions in relation to approximately 60 enforcement cases before her. She decided that 15, some 25% of those cases, were immune from enforcement because a time bar of 10 years had been exceeded and that the council were, therefore, legally unable to bring proceedings against those cases. A Freedom of Information Act request by a Point Clear resident has uncovered that approximately £178,000 of council taxpayers' money was spent on representation by the council in this inquiry against people who could not afford expensive legal representation themselves. In fact, the people of Point Clear were represented legally by two volunteers with no formal legal expertise and at no cost. This accentuates the point that an expensive legal team, led by a top London QC and paid for by the council taxpayer, lost 25% of the cases it took to the inquiry. Local people in Point Clear are alleging that they have been harassed by the council for 10 years or more. I trust that the leader of the council would agree with me that it is time for the harassment of these people by planning enforcement to stop. So my question is as follows. Please will the leader give an assurance to the people of Point Clear that no action will be taken to raise additional enforcement notices or start criminal proceedings in relation to the matters decided by the inspector at the inquiry. Finally, I feel sure that an internal inquiry might be appropriate to ascertain whether spending £178,000 of council taxpayers' money was a good use of council tax funds and whether the intention of gaining consistency of approach has been met. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everett. Councillor Stock. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Everett, for your question. Um, members will be aware of planning enforcement action that was taken by the Council in 2017 and 2018 following a decision by the Planning Committee. The Council served enforcement notices on 78 properties in the area after it became clear that homes were being occupied all year despite planning conditions banning permanent residents during the winter months. The action was taken due to concern about the heightened flood risk during the winter months with the properties not suitable and presenting a significant risk of loss of life in the event of a major flood. Many residents exercised their rights to appeal against the enforcement notices and a planning inspector held an inquiry into the issue over the summer last year. At the inquiry, the council was supported by the Environment Agency who presented evidence about the risk of flooding, its likely severity and the consequences to the area. Occupants and owners of the properties were also able to put forward their case. The inspector issued her decisions on the 18th of December 2019, and of the 48 notices appealed, 30 were dismissed, 17 were allowed, one appeal had lapsed before being heard. However, even with the minority that were allowed, the inspector refused to grant planning permission due to the location and type of properties. I am sure the complexity of the ongoing issues in relation to Point Clear Bay 
is well recognised. The situation is far from ideal and I have every sympathy for those individuals who are, who are affected. But a do-nothing approach was not an option. If there is another significant flood event, it is our duty to minimise the risk as much as we can, not only for the residents who are living there, but also for the emergency services who may be called into action. This is summed up by the inspector's response in one particular appeal, where she states, and I quote, and I quote at some length here, but I do quote, I can clearly understand how unfair it may appear to require some occupiers to leave during the winter months when many others can lawfully remain all year round. However, the potential risk from a flood event is consideration of substantial weight. Paragraph 40 of the NPPG says, proposals that are likely to increase the number of people living or working in areas of flood risk require careful consideration. Thus, the government's policy is not to increase the burden for emergency and other services by increasing the number of people living in areas of flood risk. In my view, the inspector still, in my view, the inconsistency between one property to another is a matter that can be afforded little weight in the determination of this appeal. The reality is that the evidence demonstrates that allowing permanent rather than seasonal occupation increases risk as there is an increased probability of flooding occurring during the winter months. End of quote. Chairman, the risk of flooding in this area is not merely hypothetical or theoretical, it is very real. It happened before. 1953 may well be a long time ago, but there are many members of our community, indeed members of this council, who remember vividly the terrible loss of life that occurred on January the 31st that year. Obviously, the cost of defending 48 appeals, appeals has been significant. However, not only is the cost per case lower than a standard appeal, but the difficult question that frankly has no easy answer is what price do we put on people's lives? A report detailing the outcome of the inquiry and recommending next steps will be presented to the Planning Committee once the inspector's decisions have been fully assessed by officers. Only after the Planning Committee has considered this report will the Council be in a position to confirm next steps. What I will reiterate, however, is that this Council will work with and support all those living in affected properties as far as is possible to achieve any further action required. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Stock, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Everett. Okay, moving on then to item 10. Uh, questions pursuant to Council Procedure Rule 11.2. These can be found on pages, just actually page 21 of your agenda. Uh, and I'd like to hear, please, from Councillor Bill Davison. As TDC rightly encourages its residents to sort out their refuse and to recycle as appropriate, can the portfolio holder of the Environment Services please advise members whether or not TDC ensures that refuse collected from the council provided bins in public places is sorted in order to ensure that any recycled materials do not go into landfill? Thank you. Councillor Talbot. Mm. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Davison, could I ask you to retake your seat while Councillor Talbot uh, speaks? Thank, thank you. That's all I was waiting for, Bill. I didn't know if there was anything. I could see you waiting. Thanks very much for the question. I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in the answer, Bill. Our recyclable material, which is collected at the curbside, is already processed by the householders of tendering into its separate components and in doing so provides a high quality sought after product which requires either none or only basic sorting and this is the basis of our waste and street sweeping contract which encompasses litter bins. Whilst the capture of recycled material from public litter bins can provide an additional stream of recyclable material the quality of such far lower quality with contamination from food and drinks material being very commonplace. And whilst bins with separate recycling compartments for different materials are also available, these too are prone to high levels of contamination as users place mixed waste in any possible bin compartment. The authority provides over 1,200 plus litter bins which are located across the entire district to both residents and visitors to the area, all of which can accept a combination of both mixed litter, food waste and wrapped dog waste. 
to sort and process the waste from these street litter bins is currently not within the scope of the contract that the authority budgets for. The authority is committed to increasing the amount of recycled as best highlighted by the recent introduction of the new waste service, which has seen our recycling rates increase by over 10%. And as part of this commitment, officers will continue to explore all possible avenues to increase our recycling within our current budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Talbot. Councillor Davison, do you have a supplementary? <coughs> Councillor Talbot, could you switch off your mic? Thank you. Yep, thank you very much for that response. Am I correct in saying that you appear to have used a lot of words to say that Tendering District Council will only seek increase in recycling rates if it doesn't cost the council any additional money? And if that is, the, is correct, how does the portfolio holder justify his position when the council has declared a climate emergency? Thank you. Councillor Talbot? Yeah, well, one of the troubles with all these things is the difference between the emotional feeling that everybody has about what's right to recycle, what's happening to the planet, uh, the Attenborough programmes on the deep sea and so on. We all know there's a commitment to try and recycle everything. But at the end of the day, we're a council with legal responsibilities and we can only do what our residents feel prepared to pay for. We really can do almost anything in terms of recycling but if you think of recycling things like that, quite frankly, Bill, what came out of those litter bins would have to go separately on a belt. It would have to have people standing either side of it, picking out, that's a bag of dog poo, that's a food container with food still in, that's a drinks container. Ah, here's a recyclable bit of material, and so on. And quite frankly, it really wouldn't be worth the cost. But if our public wanted it, if it became a demand, it's the sort of service that can be provided. People often say that some of the services you talk about, councillor, are those already provided by other authorities. But once again, it depends on the resource. We are, I believe, the third lowest rated in Essex, um, which is something to know. It means that we provide all our services economically, all within the law, and all within a budget that our residents can afford. We really aren't in a position to start going round actually making a separate service which you know is, is going to fulfil the emotional feeling you have about the need to recycle, but at the same time, is it actually going to provide much recycling? And the answer really is no. It's not going to provide very much. Most of what would be sorted out of litter bins, tipped on a belt and picked, most of it would still end up in landfill. I'm sorry, I don't think it's worth doing. But eventually, uh, the council will make decisions. Kieran. Thank you, Councillor Talbot. Uh, question two uh, from Councillor Ivan Henderson to Councillor Paul Honeywood. Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I ask the portfolio? I am sure that the portfolio holder will agree with me that everyone deserves a decent and safe home to live in. Can he therefore advise me of any future action that this councillor intends to take to make sure those relying on rented housing are protected against rogue landlords who appear to have no respect for the welfare of their tenants? Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Uh, Councillor Honeywood. Councillor Henderson, could you switch off your mic? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. With nearly 20% of our residents living in privately rented housing, it is important that we use all the powers available to us to make sure tenants are protected from landlords who do not comply with the law. We have a very strong and effective private sector housing enforcement team who are dedicated to ensuring tenants live in decent and safe homes. Over the past year, some very strong action has been taken across the whole district to protect tenants from unsafe housing. This has included serving prohibition orders and assisting tenants to find alternative accommodation in a number of cases. 
Indeed, Councillor Henderson will be aware that action to improve some poor quality housing in Dovercourt is currently being undertaken. Our successful bid to the Government's Private Sector Housing Innovation and Enforcement Fund has resulted in an award of £100,000 to survey the privately rented housing in Jaywick Sands. The information gathered from the survey work will inform future landlord engagement actions and, where necessary, enforcement action. While this action does focus on one particular area, I would like to stress that the outcome of this initiative will be looked at closely and, if successful, can be used as a blueprint for securing further future funding for other areas. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Honeywood. Councillor Henderson, did you have a supplementary? Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I ask the portfolio holder, he, he refers to an enforcement team. Can he tell me how many um, officers are in that enforcement team across and responsible for tendering? And he also refers to enforcement. What enforcement action can those officers legally take against these rogue landlords? And on the paragraph where he says that I'm aware of current action being undertaken for um, rogue landlords within the Dovercourt area. Can you tell me what that current action is? Because I know they're, they're look, the council are looking at something, but I haven't seen any action as yet. Uh, Councillor Honeywood. Thank you, Chairman. Firstly, there are five officers working in the private sector housing enforcement team. And I think it's important to say or to give a summary of our enforcement action in this financial year. There have been 369 service requests. These are requests from tenants for help. Of those, 420 have been completed so far. They have resulted in 176 informally or formally improved, 153 referred, i.e. to another team or an external agency. 90 advice given and investigated but no action taken and one withdrawn. It's also interesting that we have taken 29 enforcement notices served. Three were emergency prohibition orders and 11 were prohibition orders along with eight S11 and S12 improvement notices obliging landlords to carry out work. This is quite a workload for a five-man team, although they are working with other authorities. You talk about what's happening. I did think about this and thought it would be an idea to give you three examples. The first one was brought to the Council's attention by a councillor. This resulted in prohibition orders being issued, a licence revoked, and around £90,000 in civil penalties being issued. Another example was brought to us by uh, uh, the Council's um, attention via close links with the police. And this was around significant antisocial behaviour to, um, to neighbours and resulted in a prohibition order. The third example was brought to uh, the Council's attention by uh, residents and a member of the public. Um, joint work with housing and building services and a structural engineer have followed. This is ongoing. Of these three examples, the two latter examples are in Councillor Henderson's neck of the woods. In fact, one was an action day um, and it followed um, on... Uh, uh, or people will be aware of it from coverage in the standard. So we do have a positive approach. We are working forward and we are taking action. And I hopefully that gives some actions. And what's also important is we are working with other people. And the examples given, we are working with the police. We're working with planning as well to make a positive difference. Thank you, Chairman, and I hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Councillor Honeywood. OK, uh, moving on, item 11, report of the Leader of the Council, urgent Cabinet or Portfolio Holders' decisions. There are no such reports on this occasion. Item 12, minutes of committees can be found on pages 23 to 84. Councillor Stock. Uh, Chairman, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, uh, uh, sorry, Chairman. I'm happy to move all those minutes um, on block. OK. All those in favour? It is carried. Thank you. Item 13. Motion to Council mitigation of the impact of fireworks on animals and vulnerable people. This is available in your agenda pages 85, 86. Councillor S. Honeywood. Uh, fireworks can be a source of fear and distress for many animals, including pets, farm, livestock and wildlife. Animals affected not only suffer distress, but can also cause themselves injuries as they attempt to run away or hide. There is also evidence to show the vulnerable people can also suffer. For example, fireworks can aggravate a nervous condition causing distress or anxiety. This motion isn't about trying to ban fireworks or preventing people from enjoying public firework di displays. It's about helping others who may be adversely affected by them. I hope you will support this, e uh, th this evening. This, yeah. And I'd like to take this on the night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I have a seconder, please? Seconded, Councillor Williams. Uh, Councillor Clifton. Sorry, Councillor Allen, I believe, was first. My apologies, I missed you, Terry. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to move a motion on, on this item, please. An amendment? Uh, sorry, an amendment. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I, I sorry. Think that, um... Sorry. Can I hold you, Councillor Allen? Um, first of all, I do need to make a decision whether I'm actually going to hear the motion tonight or not, which uh, the legal officer has just pointed out, and I should have known that. Um, I am happy to hear this uh, tonight, so I'm happy for you to go ahead with your... Sorry. Sorry, can you stop? Okay. It's all a question of doing things in the right order. I'm new to this. Sorry, Councillor Allen. Um, bear with me. Um, okay. Um, in order for this to go ahead, I'm, I'm happy to hear it tonight. Um, would uh, the mover of the motion care to make any further comment, or are you happy where you are? Excellent. A seconder, Councillor Williams, would you care to speak now, or would you prefer to reserve your right? Which would you prefer? Thank you, Councillor Williams. That being the case... Now I can happily take your amendment, Councillor Allen. Sorry for the delay. I'm still learning this new system. <laughs> um, well, my amendment would be, I would like this to go, not to be discussed or, or, or sorted tonight, is to go to a scrutiny. Because although it's quite commendable with this, this uh, motion, because especially in my area, the, the dog, with, especially with dogs and animals, uh, is, is the interference from this. But I feel the motion is weak because it doesn't really point out the, the real problem. And if I can use a Tory, uh, what would you say, analogy, I think they're chasing the wrong fox with this one. Because if you, if you look at number one, to require all public works, public firework display within the local area boundaries to be advertised in in advance. Well, I've got to say, most of them are advertised all over the place because that's how they get people to go. So, really, that's already done. The third one, to encourage local suppliers of the third bullet point, fireworks to stock quieter fireworks for public to stay. The word encourage. What we're going to do, have a chat with them, say, don't sell them, sell the much more expensive, quiet ones or are we going to penalise them for doing it? The second one, I, I agree with. We should put it out there. And what I'm saying is talking about the analogy of the fox is we should be chasing or getting hold of the um, private people that have them. Councillor Terry, can I just... Sorry to brood you on, but can I ask you to give, give me your amendment as you would like to see it, please? Right. I would like the amendment to read... That, that the 
the, the decision on this motion, not made tonight, but to the motion be put to a scrutiny committee to further investigate a better way of dealing with this situation and then bring it back to council when all the information and everyone's had a chance to really investigate, checking their areas and, and we can really have a, a strong, permanent um, solution to it. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Can you bear with me just a moment? The uh, Chief Executive is putting that into words, I believe. Do you want to do that? Um, Councillor Allen, if I may, um, just to clarify your, your um, amendment. The decision to, uh, you are, you are moving that it be referred to a scrutiny committee for consideration of all aspects of the proposal. Yep. Okay. Okay. And you need a seconder. Need a seconder for that, please. Yes? Councillor Clifton. Uh, yes, no, I'd love to second that motion, actually, because he's kind of stolen my thunder uh, of what I was going to say. I am a huge um, enthusiast for pyrotechnic displays, such as fireworks, uh, everything from your humble sparkler always up to the, the great big explosive rockets. I do, however, completely agree with a lot of what is said in the motion as it stands. However, I do feel it lacks a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of meat on the bone, as it were. I'm, I'm completely in agreement that firework displays do cause a lot of stress to animals and vulnerable people. Myself and Councillor Knowles, as an example, um, are on the Walton and Ace Carnival Committee, and last year we put on a reduced noise fireworks display. This went down without a hitch. We had um, people actually bring dogs along to it and they were quite happy to sit there and watch the visual spectacular unfold before them with waggling towels, apart from Jack Russell which sort of yaps at everything. But um, we were praised by the locals, we have people there, we have children with disabilities who they can't normally take them to big outdoor displays because the noise is too much for the children. Whereas the visual display that we had was a lot more appropriate and the loudest it got was to a loud crackle for the finale at the end. But I will add points to this. Um, item number three, so my example of meat on the bone, item number three, to encourage local suppliers of fireworks to stop quieter fireworks for public display. Did you? As I said, we've had a reduced noise display. They already do. Um, the emphasis, a lot of this, is on fireworks suppliers and as Councillor Allen said, we're going after the wrong fox. I think it should be event organisers who are held accountable for this because it is on the onus is on them to ask the suppliers what they want in their display. If I'd have said to the company, I want a fireworks display, they would have done a standard fireworks display to the room of the area we had it. It was only thanks to me saying, I want a reduced noise display, that they're the type of fireworks that we had. Um, there's a couple other issues here, but I do, you know, there's a lot that I could go into. I mean, for example, where we turn around and say that public firework displays should be advertised in advance, do we have a remit to how far we go on that? Is it just restricted to social media? Does it have to go to newspapers, local publications, posters? How far do we go? We're demanding on that. I've got a couple of others. Um, and also, again, um, I think we're going after the wrong people because a lot of people, fireworks, dis public fireworks displays now are very few and far between because of the costs involved, insurance, etc. The only sort of regular event I know is Clacton Pier who do a really good display every year. Everything else is more private displays and it's people being um, inappropriate with the type of fireworks they lay their hands on. And maybe this council should more move towards suppliers restricting the sale of particular grades of fireworks to the people they serve. But again, in a scrutiny committee, this can be discussed in a lot more in depth. A lot more research can be done with regards to how many public displays go on, can speak to local um, suppliers such as supermarkets and the professional fireworks companies, and a scrutiny committee, I think, would be more in prepared to do that. Just quickly, um, I would ask the question of um, the chief executive of the legal team. Um, do we have, actually have an officer who is trained um, to deal with preparation for fireworks displays. I may overrun just slightly, but when we came to, um, for the Walton Carnival, came to our health and safety advisory meeting, 
The topic of fireworks was discussed there. We spent about 30 seconds on it, not a lot. And then when it came to four days before the event, I asked for a key to access a certain area. And Clifton, could you back. please wrap up now? I Thank am you. indeed. Thank I got you. a phone call back saying, we're not allowing you to launch from there. Well, that should have been discussed a lot sooner at the health and safety advisory meeting. And the people I spoke to looked at our safety diagram and were terrified about the fallout zone from fireworks because they thought that's where the display would be launching from. That's not where certain fireworks from certain altitudes would fall in certain wind conditions. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clifton. <laughs> Councillor Culver. And please remain seated. Well, I've got a green light, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far, but may I just come at this from a slightly different angle, please, um, in support of the amendment, but from a slightly different point of view. And may I say, in saying this, you know I have total respect for you, both as an individual councillor and in your position as Vice Chair of the Council. But may I suggest to you that because the motion calls for the council to participate in a public awareness scheme, there are implications for the council, both in terms of resources, capacity and finance. And for this to be taken on the night without any of that being given prior consideration by officers, and for none of that information to be able to be laid before councillors to enable them to have, give that consideration when they're making their decision, I believe to be wrong, and I would ask you to reconsider. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Culver. Um, certainly, uh, I respect your opinion and your advice greatly, um, more than many others. So thank you. Bear with me one moment. Councillor Stock. Um, yeah, we seem to be having almost uh, in bit danger of having a sort of big, um, a violent agreement, I think the phrase is. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it going on. I think Councillor Calvin made, a, made a, a, a very, very powerful statement there that it's very difficult to argue against what he just said, actually. Um, if there is, you know, I've always tried, on the one hand, you try and do the sort of democratic transparency, open government bit where motions are taken as quickly as possible. They're not kicked off to the long grass. They're taken on the night, if at all possible. But on the other hand, you do have to weigh up are there unforeseen consequences, consequences that we, you know, we, we didn't realise were in because of the wording of the motion? So, um, Councillor Allen's suggestion to send it off to Nathan Scrutiny, I certainly don't have a problem with it. As I understand it, uh, and I'll stand to be corrected, um, the wording comes verbatim from the RSPCA, um, and I think it's been strictly adhered to. Having said that, I, I can't see what can be wrong with uh, an Nathan Scrutiny uh, committee really getting their teeth into it and looking at the implications, looking at what our legal duties are. Um, I strongly suspect and suggest that our powers to uh, enforce fireworks to be quieter or people to um, advertise their firework displays are somewhat limited, to put it mildly. But nevertheless, uh, you know, nevertheless, that doesn't mean we should do nothing and we should stand idly by. This has become a bit of an issue. The issue of fireworks that do seem to go off. When I was younger, it was just November the 5th. Now you get New Year's, and then you get people's birthdays, you get Chinese New Year, you get lots and lots of other events throughout the year. And I know for people who have dogs that are particularly affected by, but and it's particularly dogs, but not all dogs, my dog's fine with fireworks for some reason, but other dogs go absolutely crazy and it can be very, very distressing for them. So I have a lot of sympathy for the motion. But if the right thing to do is to send it off to an Avian Scrutiny Commission to properly thrash it out, I'm absolutely relaxed about that. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Um, in that case, as I made the decision to hear it on the night, um, the best thing to do will be to ask the mover and the seconder of the original motion to accept the amendment. If they do that, we can then send it to the scrutiny committee. So can I ask Councillor Sue Honeywood, are you happy for that to happen? Councillor McWilliams, are you happy? Both are happy to do that, so the amendment is accepted. And now we need to vote on that amendment, which will be Councillor Allen's amendment, which uh, I believe... Mr. Davison has written down. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. So it would be referred to, and it would be the Community Leadership Scrutiny Committee, Community Scrutiny Committee for consideration of all aspects of the proposal as per the paper. Thank you. That sounds good to me. Okay, so that's the amendment. Those in favour of the amendment, please show. That looks pretty clear. Thank you. Do we need to do this? Okay, thank you. 
Moving on, item 14, recommendation from the Cabinet Local Council Tax Support Scheme 2020-2021, Council Tax Exemptions Discounts 2020-21 and the Annual Minimum Revenue Provision Policy Statement 2020-21, pages 87 to 136 on your agendas. Uh, Councillor Googly Army, I believe. Councillor Honeywood, even. Yep. Um, I would like to move that as written, please. Thank you, Councillor Honeywood. Uh, no second required. Anybody? Those in favour, please show. And that motion is carried. Thank you. Item 15. Recommendation from the Cabinet, a new corporate plan 2020-24 can be found on pages 137 to 146 of your agenda. Councillor Stock. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, bottom of, yeah, bottom of page 137 on to page 138 is the recommendation, which I'm happy to move, um, that the final proposals for the corporate plan um, be uh, agreed, basically, but I'll take it, I'll, I'll move it as, as written. Um, the corporate plan, members will all be aware, it's been to Cabinet on several occasions, it's been to overview and scrutiny committees, it's been to parish and town councils across the district, we've had an extensive consultation process on it, and, uh, you know, of course, importantly, we've actually taken on board the responses from the consultation, so on page 143, I think you see the original draft, and then on page 145, um, you see the subtly amended one to take on board all the comments that came back, um, and, I, and I, I think it's a, it's a nice, clean and clear corporate plan, the time was we used to have a corporate plan that was as thick as your arm, it was like a yellow pages telephone directory for those of us old enough to remember them um, and we've got this down to a very simple clean and clear document that highlights our commitment, specifically about community leadership uh, you know, and, and the firework issue we just talked about it's all about community leadership, it's not about draconian powers that we've got because we haven't got them, but we do lead the community and tendering for growth, we want to grow our business sector, we want to grow the economy of tendering, we want our residents to get wealthier, healthier and wiser. And um, Chairman, I commend it to the Council. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Again, no seconder required. Any comments? Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as I've said before, um, and obviously I support everything in here, and I, I know officers have already done good work on some of this in the past. My fear is um, uh, when councils do put these type of uh, statements out and reports out is that sometimes they end up as just words alone and the actions don't follow. And I, I do think there should be some mechanism here and I know the leader just said some of these we've got no statutory responsibility for delivering some of these policies, but there are policies here that we are taking responsibility for, and I do think we need to have some kind of strong performance indicators to show where we are delivering on these issues, if you like, along the lines of key performance indicators, because we never know how far we've come. If you look at deprivation in some areas, whether you look for house building, affordable houses in some areas, we're not seeing the indicators to show that we are benefiting people. Where we're talking about law and order, where we're talking about poverty, we need to show that we are making a difference and those indicators can be shown to the public. It's okay putting something up on our website look, which looks all nice and glossy, but they need to show that the, our actions speaks as loud as our words in a document. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Any others? Okay, can we go to the vote then, please? Uh, those in favour of motion as printed, please show. Thank you, that's carried. Excellent. Item 16, report submitted to Council by an overview and scrutiny committee. There are none on this occasion. Uh, item 17, report of the Chief Executive A1 Membership of Committees, page 147148. Mr Davison, sir. Thank you, Chairman. As per the your agenda, pages on 147148. Thank you. Thank you. Item 18. 
Report of the Head of Democratic Services and Elections A2, High Level and Light Touch Review of Members' Allowances by the Independent Remuneration Panel. This can be found pages 149158. Councillor Stock. Chairman, um, I would like to move um, uh, the motion as printed on um, pieces of paper that everyone has in front of them. It says item 18, report A2. Um, and I, and I, before I speak to it, I'll get a second from... Yeah, I'll second the chairman. Thank you. Okay, um, so just to give a little bit of background, um, especially for the benefit of new members, really, we have an independent remuneration panel, it's a statutory requirement, and they make recommendations about allowances for members. Um, we agreed uh, at the annual council meeting back in May, which members will recall was the first election, <coughs> sorry, the first meeting after the council elections, and we agreed then um, that we would have a light touch review, particularly in consultation with group leaders. And that was carried out, and group leaders made recommendations, made comments, um, particularly, and if I may embarrass him by saying so, Mark Simpson made a really detailed and thorough comment that other group leaders chipped in and said, well, we agree with Mark, including myself. Um, and it hasn't quite come out in the wash, um, and, I, and I feel they've been missed. So the recommendation there is saying um, that... I'm basically reflecting the fact that we, there are now, um, we used to have 60 councillors on tenure council, we've now got 48. So there were 25% more councillors uh, covering this district than there are now. Clearly our workload as individual councillors has gone up considerably. The population has only gone up as well. So we've all got far more, we've all got 25% plus more residents to deal with and issues and concerns. And because we're a smaller council, you know, I particularly noticed I went to a planning committee a few weeks ago and I was particularly impressed with the fact that it was a seamless committee. You couldn't tell what side of the political divide any particular councillor was on. You couldn't tell what party they belonged to. They were all working together like a, like a whole lot of cogs in a gearbox. Um, even particularly new councillors, particularly guys sitting over there, um, you know, opposition, administration alike, were just working for the greater good of making difficult planning decisions and I was impressed by that. People are pulling their weight, people are working hard, and I think it's, it should be reflected a little bit, and we have missed out. We've slipped. When I first got elected to tendering in 2003, a backbench member got about 4,500. A culture councillor back then only got about 2,000. Well, a culture councillor now, a backbench is getting nearly 8,000, and we've, we've somehow slipped down a bit. So I am suggesting a very small increase in the basic allowance for all members to £6,000. I'm suggesting that the group leader situation be rectified because that's become a bit of a bone of contention. We've had all sorts of definitions of what a group leader is when actually the law defines what a group leader is. Basically, if you've got a group of two members or more and you're the leader, um, I'm suggesting you should get the group leader's allowance. I know that means there's some incredibly small groups, um, but that's just the way the cookie crumbles. I think trying to sort of say, no, but you shouldn't get the allowance unless you've got so many people. We've got a formula that's based on how many people are in the group so the bigger the group, the more you'll get. I also think, when it comes to special responsibility allowances, we've always had this rule, which is slightly perverse, that you can only claim one SRA. That means people are doing jobs and they're not getting paid for it. And I don't think we'd do that with our staff. I know we wouldn't do that with our staff, either here at the council or in our businesses that we run ourselves. So I don't think that's fair and reasonable. And also, I think that the Vice Chairman of Planning does do, uh, does do a job above and beyond and, and should get that extra SRA that the IRP were considering. So, Chairman, without going into huge detail on it, I'm, I'm happy to expand on my thinking, um, but as written, it's a sort of legalistic thing. I have taken advice on it. I have looked at the legal implications of it and the financial implications, and I'd like to move that recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we had our group uh, opposition meeting last night, and we had got our response to the, what was in the agenda and I was to lead on this. Um, so I'm a little bit disappointed that at 11 hour 59 minutes I've had an amendment which could have given, been given to me way before this meeting. So with your indulgence Chair, I would like to ask for an adjournment so we, I can go and discuss this with my group and failing that I can't believe I could actually make any decision on this at all. Thank you Chairman. We will be pleased. Uh, Councillor Stock, quickly. No, if, if it helps, I'm more than happy to, yep. uh, uh, to yep. agree. Not that it's my decision, yep. but I, I'll just, in my defence, say that I literally had the final 
version of it about half an hour before the meeting started. So I fully take your point. It's a perfectly valid one. You're quite right. Yep. Um, I, I was still mulling it over and considering and getting all the legal uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. Thank you, Councillor Stock. I'm, I'm very happy to... Um, by all means. A point of clarification from the um, uh, monitoring officer on where we stand on, on this move tonight on legal grounds, because it does say in the legal... Um, explanation notes in the document that the local authorities members allowance England regulation 203 set out in the arrangements to be followed in relation to allowances and expenses paid to council. The regulation sets out that regard must be had to the recommendations of an independent remunerations panel before determining or amending the scheme of allowance. Surely we've had that. I'd like that clarification made by the, um, the monitoring officer because um, it seems that this is going against that part of local government. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I'm happy to do that. If the monitoring officer is happy to do it, I think it would be wise to do it before um, a short adjournment. So the regulations do... Um specifically state that um, full council must have regard to the recommendations of the independent remuneration panel um, that and following that principle with local government decision making if you have regard to something and you wish to depart from it which you are entitled to do as full council it is full council that makes the decision on the members allowance scheme taking into consideration the outcome of any review if you wish to depart from the recommendations then you uh, should provide reasons for um, that departure thank you um, at the request of councillor stevenson i think it's a very reasonable request um, i am going to adjourn the meeting now for 15 minutes in order that you can have the discussion you need to Thank you. Meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chairman. OK, thank you, members. Um, that was a, a timely moment. It gave me time to get coffee, which is always good. Thank you for that. Um, OK, moving back, we will continue then. Uh, we have a motion before us as set out on the paper you received at the beginning of the meeting. Um, we will now debate that motion. Um, Councillor Stevenson is not deemed to have spoken as yet. That was a point of clarification. Um, can I uh, clarify, uh, Councillor Cugliami, I believe you seconded the motion and you held your, you reserved your right to speak, is that correct? Thank you, I've got that right. Good, I know where we're at. Okay, um, ready to debate the motion. Speakers, please. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Chair. I think it's only fair that I go first. Um, so we've had a, a conversation about this um, and the general consensus is that we're not happy with it. Um, we don't feel that this is in the true spirit of things that are going on at the moment. It isn't in line with what the IRP recommended and we, to a, most of us anyway at least, will be not supporting this chairman. Um, I must admit, when I saw this, it does tick a few boxes for me, but it also ticks, unticks a huge amount. And I didn't feel I could vote on it because personally I would do very well out of this recommendation. And so, is this an amendment on the agenda and we are discussing this? This is the motion. This is the motion. So I would like to put forward an amendment to this motion that we return to the agenda, what was the report in the agenda, and discuss the two options, A and B, I believe. As recommended. When he said, when I find them. Well, sorry. In parts, yeah, because to go to the conclusion recommendations of the IRP in 1A and B. So that would be my amendment, please, Chairman. Thank you. Bear with me one moment. Do that. Thank you. Carry on. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to clarify, this is not a negation and therefore it is um, except an amendment. Um, but can I clarify, Councillor Stevenson, are you saying, um, apologies, that as per page 149, you are moving the, the original recommendations as per 
the report which was in the booklet as opposed to the, 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 moved, the, the motion moved on the paper. I am. Thank you. Second. I need a seconder, please. Councillor Bush, thank you. Okay, so we will debate the amendment initially. Comments? Councillor Stock. Just a point of order, sorry. Was it A or B that was being moved then? I didn't understand. Clarify. Yep, that's what you asked. Stop if I may clarify on, on that as I, as I understood it, I asked Councillor Stevenson, was he moving the recommendations as per page 149? And he said, yes, he was. So I'm taking it that it is as per the recommendations on page yeah, 149. Thank you. If I may, sorry, it, the recommendation on 149 is that council approve either A or B. Oh, sorry. So there has to be a decision. So which? B, I mean, if it's, I don't mind which one you're going for. I just need to know that's all. Sorry. Chairman, if it makes any clarification, as I was a mover of the motion, B. B. Thank you. That's nice and clear. Couldn't be clearer than that. Excellent. So uh, we are therefore debating the amendment, which is to accept part B as on page 149 of your agendas. Any further comment? Yep. Okay. Councillor Stevenson, would you like to sum up, therefore? I'm oh, sorry. I don't think Councillor I'm summing Stevenson, up, Chairman. I, I think I'm started. <laughs> I'm really sorry, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Henderson has just indicated, and it would be better for you to go last. Um, that way you can sum up. Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, that, I support the uh, amendment uh, that has just been put forward and oppose the uh, leader's amendment to the remuneration panel's um, decision and recommendations. And the reason I do that, and I said it very briefly, just, just a minute ago, I said the corporate plan needs to be meant and not just on paper. And if you go back to the corporate plan, it says strong finances and governance. And as soon as we steer clear, we've just voted on that, we steer clear, and this administration moves straight away from their own corporate plan because they then look at actually increasing, without evid any evidence, without any facts, the amount of money that councillors should have in this council. And it weren't long ago that members opposite, including members on this side, had in their leaflets when they went to the public and made that contract with them that they were reducing councils, councillors from, from 60 to 48, that they were going to save the council £60,000. And I think that was the leader who said, we need to do more for less. Now, you've broken that contract with your um, electorate, and we wonder why voters out there don't trust councillors and politicians when they go back so quickly on their decisions. It wasn't long ago. You wouldn't have done this prior to last May. I guarantee that. You wouldn't have taken that risk. We're talking about eight, just eight months ago, and we're talking about now putting 40,000 back after taking... 60,000 out. And shortly after, a cabinet, um, a cabinet decision to actually do away with £80,000, go into a good cause to climate change, but taking that away for the voluntary sector, the voluntary sector who desperately needs funds to keep itself going out there, looking after the very groups that we talk about here time and time again, who are actually supporting those people in those areas are li living in poverty and and deprivation. I cannot believe they've actually got the hypocrisy to actually stand here and say they now deserve, deserve more money. It's just totally wrong and we should not be supporting this. My group will not have this in their name and I take offence to the um, part in this, uh, this policy document which has been put forward by the leader, which says that leaders discussed this, more or less saying that leaders discussed this in October. No, we did not. I've made it very clear on a number of occasions, my group will not support any additional costs when it comes to members' allowance. And um, I think the leader is absolutely clear on that. There was no, no suggestion by any leader within that meeting that said we should increase these allowances. 
So I saw, support, Thank you, Councillor Henson. I support I... the amendment what's been put forward, that we go with B on the back of the um, remuneration uh, recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I will get back to you, Councillor Stevenson, I promise. Councillor Miles. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I also want to express my huge disappointment. I will use the word disappointment rather than disgust at this uh, new proposal that's put forward this evening. Um, when I sat on the other side of the chamber, I was one of the people who was very keen to support the reduction in number of councillors and to make a saving to the taxpayer. At no stage during that time, and it was raised in this chamber on more than one occasion, and a lot of objections to the reduction in the number of councillors, but not at any stage was there any suggestion whatsoever that their increased workload would lead to additional expenses for councillors. And when I look at this, and when having been an officer all my life, 40 years dedicated to public service, I'm appalled because I'm sure, I haven't had time to do the research, but I'm sure that if I looked at some of our lowest paid staff working in tendering district council as well as across the whole country, you will find the pro rata what you're recommending is absolutely an insult to them, actually. And I have to say, I am really disappointed. And I want it put on record that I'm totally opposed to this paper that's been put forward this evening. I cannot believe that any honourable councillor could support it. I certainly haven't become a councillor to get expenses. I've put myself forward to represent my residents because I want to be able to serve them. And I want to be able to serve them with pride and with dignity because I think it's such a great privilege for people to trust you to represent them. And I don't want to be supporting such a proposal as this, if I'm honest. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miles. Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going to be supporting item B at the moment. I must admit I was going to abstain from this that was put in front of me. I don't like things put in front of me as I come into a meeting. I like time to digest it and work out all the figures. And on that note, I will really look forward to the IRP review in March. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chapman. Councillor Steady. Um, yeah, I would just like to make a few comments on the uh, leader's amendment here. It looks more than a light touch to me. It looks like a heavy touch. Um, no restrictions to the SRA. I feel that could be open to abuse because it could be um, the Old Friends Act. You'd have three people um, stitching up the, uh, either the um, administration. And you, you're probably all familiar with that. It's probably money for the few. Failure could be rewarded. The portfolio might not be up to the position, and yet it could be in the gang of three and be given another SRA. If we can find £41,000 to fund this, I'm sure that we could find other monies to fund other initiatives, like, for instance, the roads into the area, to, to give them a, a, a spruce up. Um, we, gave our, we gave our promise that when we cut the number of councillors down, it was to save money and to be efficient. And now if we go back on that, um, I just think we're going to leave ourselves open for many, many adverse comments from the electorate. Thank you, Councillor Steady. Councillor Stock. Uh, Chairman, I won't dwell on this. I think we should go to the vote as quickly as possible. Um, I, you know, I'll just say that um, if, if this does go the way that my proposal is agreed, I trust those with, with the faux moral outrage won't be taking any extra money, that they'll be refusing to take it um, and not taking lots of allowances from lots of different political positions because I'll take criticism from some councillors but I won't take criticism from the leader of the Labour group who sits on three different authorities and gets an allowance from all of them. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't and I think it's a perfectly reasonable. We're talking about 444 quid. We're not talking about thousands of pounds in extra money. And just to be absolutely clear, um, the Local Government Boundary Committee for England yeah, in um, looking at the number of councillors, made it absolutely categorically clear that a reason to reduce the number of councillors could not be to save money. 
We, we, all want, we all knew that. We all know that. So let's pretend that's why we did it. Being efficient, yes, right? you? Um, but to save money, no, we're still saving money by doing this. We're still saving money, but we're also acknowledging in a tiny way, as I say, councils now have 25% more residents, 25% more work to do. Uh, and the percentage here, by way of an increase, is, I don't know, what is it, about 8%. So um, it's quite reasonable. Uh, I don't support the amendment. I should be voting against it and recommending um, that my original motion be agreed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Stock. Finally, Councillor Stevenson. Before I do, Chair, can I have a clarification on the, one of the Leader's comments? He said, I hope you won't be taking the money. I believe we don't get that choice. Could the officer provide that answer, answer for me? We'll leave that, we'll leave that release. Um, they are allowances, and you can uh, elect not to claim the allowance. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. I apologise, Chairman. That was different to the advice I was given three years ago when I had this very same conversation. Um, am I summing up? You are. OK. No problems. Um, I feel a little bit guilty in uh, I put this, my comments to the IRP and the leader has taken some of those comments and made his proposals based on that. And I feel like I part, I'm partly responsible, possibly, for the recommendation in front of us from the leader. But that, I did want to clear, clarify a couple of things. That was to the IRP, the Independent Remuneration Panel. And this is the bit I, why I sent such a detailed thing, is because I don't feel comfortable dictating my own wages, my own allowances, for clarity. And I think that's why I made such a long, in-depth argument with the Independent Remuneration Panel. And I was quite happy to accept, whatever they may be, the Independent Remuneration Panel's decision. Now, the leader's decision, whilst taking into it some of the points, goes far beyond the Independent Remuneration Panel. And it ignores the, the advice where it says, in doing so, it is so reflected on the fact that a full review of the scheme was scheduled later in the municipal year. If there was continuing views and evidence to be considered in respect to these matters, then that would be the appropriate time to receive these. So that was when we should have been done it. And if my amendment does succeed, I would like to see the leader's proposals go to the IRP in March. But as I stated at the beginning, and I will continue to hold that position, it's an IRP's decision, not ours, and therefore I'll be going against the leader's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So we will now be voting on the amendment. Hold, sorry. Sorry, I just want to clarify, I have already said this, but because you're just about to go to the vote, I think it's important, i say it again, is that the decision does rest with council. You just said it was the IRP's decision. It isn't. The IRP make recommendations in a report which you have regard to when you make your decision. I just needed to make that clarification. I do apologise. I think the monitor of have corrected me. I'll need 10 councillors to stand for that, please. And I believe I have them. Uh, name vote. And for that, I will hand over to the Chief Executive. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. So just to clarify, we are going on the amendment, and the amendment is the recommendation on page 149, and B is little b, which is the, um, is the, um, the, the amendment as, as stated uh, previously. So I shall read out the name of the councillor. Please state clearly whether you are for, against, or abstain. Uh, could I ask first... Exactly where are we? We're dealing with the amendment moved by Mark, but we already had an amendment moved by the Leader of the Council. Can I clarify right. that? If I may, where are we? Where's, the, where's that, that going to go? OK, if I may, Chairman, the, we did not have an amendment from the Leader, um, um, if I may, Councillor. Um, oh, sorry. 
We did not have an amendment from the Leader. The paper which was put before you was your substantive motion. The, mo the, 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 um, the recommendation on the page on, the, on your booklet was never moved. And therefore, this was what was moved and seconded, and therefore was your substantive motion. Councillor Stevenson, as an amendment, moved the recommendation which was in your booklet as page 149, um, with the t taking little b, where it asks for the council to approve either A or B on little on big B, um, little one, um, subsection little b. So this is your amendment, which is as per your booklet. Um, if this if this is if the amendment succeeds, that becomes your substantive motion. If it falls, that becomes your substantive motion. It would be quite clear that somewhere we get to Neil's motion with all the talk. So you're saying that if the amendment is carried, fair enough, we, have a, a, we will then make it a substantive motion and we have the motion in the book as amended by Mark. If that's defeated, therefore we're going back to the book and we're then dealing with the motion that Neil Stock moved. No. If I may, oh, if no. I may when do we get to Neil's no. motion? No. That's if, what I'm asking. If I may, counts, if I may Councillor, you may not get to uh, the Leader's um, um, motion because this motion, which, uh, which was your substantive motion, has been amended as by Councillor Stevenson. That then has become your amendment. Should that part, should that be carried, that will become your substantive motion and you will then vote on that and you may, part, you may carry that or not. However, if the amendment falls, you will then return to the leader's substantive, the, the leader's original motion, which will then be voted upon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have, been, we have asked for an, a, a, um, a named vote. So I'm now going to read out the councillor, each councillor's name. Please clearly state where you're voting for, against, or abstain. Okay, as per, so we are, move, we are voting, just as a reminder, amendment. on the amendment. Page 149. As per page 149. Okay. Councillor Alexander. Sorry, I couldn't hear you, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Councillor Amos. Yes. Councillor Barry. For. Councillor Bray. Against. Councillor Broderick. Yes. Councillor Bush. For. Councillor Calver. Yes. Councillor Casey. For. Councillor Chapman. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Thank you. Councillor Chittock. Okay. Councillor Clifton. For. Councillor Codling. Councillor Coley. Councillor Davidson. Councillor Davis. Councillor Fairley. Councillor Fowler. Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Carlo Gugliami. Councillor Val Gugliami. Councillor Harris. Councillor Ivan Henderson. Councillor Joe Henderson. Councillor Paul Honeywood. Councillor Sue Honeywood. Councillor King. Councillor Knowles. Councillor McWilliams. Councillor Miles. Councillor Morrison. Councillor Newton. Councillor Placey. Councillor Porter. Can I ask, please, you don't speak whilst I'm reading out the vote so I can be heard. Thank you. Councillor Porter. Councillor Scott. Councillor Skeels. Councillor Steady. Councillor Gemma Stevenson. Councillor Mark Stevenson. Councillor Stock. Councillor Tolbert. Councillor Turner. Councillor White. Councillor Wiggins. And Councillor Winfield. Thank you.
Thank you. The, the vote for the amendment was 420 against the amendment 22, three abstentions and three not present. And therefore, the amendment is defeated. Thank you. We now return to the substantive motion, which is as per your paper before you. Thank you. Chairman, can we... Okay, so we return to the original motion, a paper handed out at the beginning of the meeting, this fellow here. Um, I've seen no request for a name vote this time, so... Yep, you can by all means debate it, yes. So that is now the motion before us. Councillor Joe Henderson. Yeah, I would just like to say, as a councillor sitting on this side, I am so embarrassed that this is even before us tonight. I cannot believe, I sat on big society where we've got groups crying out for money to be told now there's no money and yet you on that side want to give yourselves more. We were told by the leader, more for less, more for less. The council's got to do more for less. We've all got to do more for less. This is lying in pockets of councillors on the other side. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Any further speakers? Councillor Henderson. Yes, um, because it's not the first time, uh, Chairman, that uh, the leader has made a comment and just pointed at, at me being, looks like the only one who's on perhaps two authorities. Um, uh, there are other members on that side on two authorities and also getting extra special allowance at county council level. So I'd, I, he should be very clear when he makes them comments that it's not just one councillor in this room. And I am quite prepared, Councillor Stop, quite prepared to share my diary for a month's work compared to your diary for a month's work on council commitments that I make. The office there, do you take that challenge on? Because I'll, I will challenge you for the hours that I put in as a councillor at county council level, three or four times this week already, and also the, the work I do on this district council. So when you're going to get up and make comments about individual members who are gaining more than others, I would say, pro rata, the one who would gain mostly out of this is probably yourself, because you will go up to 20, over 21,000, because you will now get the leader's allowance on top of your, um, on your group leader's allowance on top of your leader's allowance. Now, that is self-interest. And there are other leaders on that side who have just voted who will get the same. Not only a portfolio holder allowance, but a leader's allowance on top. Of course you want it. Of course you want it. You couldn't wait to actually get on that, um, on that front bench to actually start increasing your wage. And I can't believe there are members who sat this side in the past who said it's not right that we increase allowances while the public out there are suffering. Suffering. I've got um, areas in my area, wards in my area, who are suffering deprivation. People who are going to food banks. People who are going to food banks. People who are going for winter warmer clothes. People who are going for hunger holidays because they can't afford, a when they're not at um, school, they can't afford a meal when they're outside. And you're just voting to give yourselves even more money in your pockets. You've taken, like I said, £80,000 from charities just recently. Money that would have gone to good causes around this area. How can you actually look at yourselves in the mirror just after that election where you've just told the electorate that we've saved you 60,000, we've cut the councillors down to 48, and then in a few months later, you ignore what you've just said on your leaflets and then put, your money, put the, the, the total money back up by 40,000. It's disgraceful. It's politics of absolute, the lowest level I can think about. I hope members, and I hope members on that side, will think again. Because when it gets outside here, and I am calling for a um, name vote on this substantive motion, when it goes outside here, when it hits those papers that you've put more money in your pockets, when people know how people are suffering out there, they Time will please, Councillor believe Anderson. you are a disgrace. Thank you. Councillor Steady. I just hope 
that when the council tax bills come out, you can all look in the mirror. You might not like what you see. And I'll, the comment about we don't have to take it, we don't have to take the increases. I'm going to take the increase. I'm not going to give it back so it goes in to pay your increases. I shall, I shall support local charities in my ward with, the, with that money I'm going to get. I might crack a few mirrors. Thank you, Councillor Steady. Councillor Barry. Um, <clears throat> right, thank you. As a uh, relatively new councillor, I find it extremely embarrassing to be standing here um, arguing with a, a lot of experienced councillors over there about accepting an increase in an allowance. Um, I think we've got much more important issues to be debating and much more important things to be spending £41,000 on. I will find it hugely embarrassing going back to the people, the 1,400 people who voted for me in Brightlingsea and explain to them that I, in six months, short six months as a councillor, have been party to an increase in allowance. I didn't, when I first became a town councillor, I didn't know we got an allowance. I didn't know I got an allowance when I started to stand for a district councillor. So I was pleasantly surprised, <laughs> sorry, and I know the amount of work I put in is tremendous. And yes, I, I accept there is a, a, a remuneration needed, but to vote for an increase at this time, you know, it, it, it's frankly embarrassing, it's ridiculous, I'll vote against it, and I will publicise all the people over there who put this up, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Thank you, Councillor Barry. Councillor Placey. Yeah, another relatively new councillor. Um, I agree with what's been said before, but one thing I would like to point out, you mentioned it's only around 8%. How many people get 8% increase? Our emergency services are around about 2% if they're lucky. How can we actually, how can we actually in, in all good conscience, accept 8% when people like that are, are being limited so low? That's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Placey. Councillor Newton. I would actually like to say to the people on the opposite side of this chamber, you had every opportunity to work with the UKIP group and you yourselves decided not to do so. All I'm actually hearing from you is a lot of sour grapes and I do take exception. To a man you walk past me, you are so ignorant you cannot even say good evening and I find it disgusting. Thank you, Councillor Newton. Councillor Porter. Uh, I'd just like to congratulate Councillor Stock on bringing this in. I think it's something that needed to be done, and I fully support it. Um, people might laugh, but at the end of the day, if you want to become a councillor, you should be paid for it. And quite frankly, we don't get paid very much for what we do. We don't get any pension or anything else for the time we give up. So a small increase is quite reasonable. I mean, the people that benefit the most are group leaders, but, you know, if you do the work, then that's fair enough. I don't think anyone's going to complain too much. The amount of money is not a great deal, and I fully support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Okay. Um, okay. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to say that I feel very few of us are here because of the allowance that we get. And, and like has, as has been mentioned on the other side, when I first started as a councillor, I had absolutely no idea of, of any allowance at all. But equally, I had no idea of the workload. And it is true that our workload has increased tremendously with the reduction of councillors. And we are, it's estimated that we should do about 15 hours work a week. That's, that's the estimate. Well, in the last few months, I've done over double that, and I'm struggling, and I have other responsibilities. There are other people here who are not retired, who, for whom that little bit extra will compensate for some of the, for the time and the effort and the emotional and physical energy that we put into this job. And I would just like to say that I 
because our workload has increased hugely, I think it is fair that we have this small increase. It's not 8% for the same job. It's 8% for 25% at least more work. And um, sorry, I've lost, I've lost my thread. But I, I don't think any of us in this chamber do this for the money. I don't think it's being greedy. And I think if people understood um, the work involved is not just attending meetings, it's meeting people, it's making phone calls, it's, it's searching, researching information, it's getting back to people. Hours and hours and hours of work. And I, I don't feel guilty for taking this because I know I put the work in. And I know lots of you, on, lots of us all over this chamber put the work in. And regarding... Uh, people that have special allowances, well, if you're doing extra work, why should you not be paid for it? I'm, I don't have a special allowance because I can't possibly take on anything else. But if somebody is doing, has two different hats, especially as there are a few of us, there is more work to go around, I think a man is, and a woman and a councillor is worthy of their pay. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I have two more speakers, and then I will return to the seconder and the motion putter. We are pushing for time. Um, can I take Councillor Talbot, please? Thank you, Chairman. I, I was almost resisting the temptation to take part in this discussion because it's quite clear that all the heart-searching and all the emotion being generated by the other side, quite frankly, is not rational argument. It's to try and make you feel a bit embarrassed about taking an increase in the member's allowance. Why should you be embarrassed for it? I started council business in 1961. There were no allowances. They were introduced in the 1972 Act and paid in 1974. So for my 13 years, my first 13 years as a councillor, there were no allowances. You're talking about the level of allowances. What a cabinet member gets now is less than I got a cabinet member when I was one of Terry's cabinets. The money is actually less now. The, the proposals that the leader put forward, which are as much a surprise to me as anybody else uh, when I read them, but they are, they've been considered, they're very satisfactory. The one you were voting for, because I can say you, that was largely the way it went, the one you were voting for took £600 from the chairman of the planning committee and gave it to the vice chairman. I couldn't see that that was a very good proposal. We're not here to try deliberately to take money away by motion from a member, but it reduced his allowance from six six to 6000 you know, what a balmy motion. How could it come that way? I don't care who the independent remuneration panel are, but all I'm saying is don't be ashamed of voting for it if you think it's worthwhile. The, the money is there. The allowances for leaders is satisfactory, even if they're only a leader of a group of two. That's Whittacombe. That's good enough, and they still have responsibilities as leader of that group and will be connected and contacted with that particular title. So all I would say to colleagues is don't be embarrassed by what's being said. That's why it's being said, to make you embarrassed. You've got nothing to be embarrassed about. The proposals are quite moderate and very satisfactory. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Talbot. I'll take Councillor Morrison, and then we'll go back to the second or remover. Councillor Morrison, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, too, am a new councillor. Actually, I'm a new councillor on Tendron District Council. I've been a councillor on Harwich Town Council for many years. I also chair uh, the Finance and General Purposes Committee there, which I don't get a single penny extra for doing that job. And that also takes up a great deal of hours through the week, as my vice chair sitting next to me, who doesn't get any money either for that. We put in a lot of hours there for our residents. I wasn't aware of what allowance we got. I stood for tendering district council because I wanted to help my residents. And I can tell you the reward, Councillor Davis, I would answer you this. My reward is not a financial reward. My reward is when one of my residents, who I've been able to help by Harwich Town Council or most definitely by tendering district council, is when I get a thank you. 
And quite frankly, there's no money that could ever pay more than somebody saying, thank you for what you've done for me. And I too am absolutely appalled. I am ashamed that you want this extra money. As has been said, it was put on your leaflets. You wanted to save all this money. Do you know what? It's one of those very rare occasions I'm pretty much lost for words. I'm absolutely appalled. And I'm, I'm, again, how you sleep at night, I don't know. Any respect that I was starting to have for some of you, I've certainly lost tonight, I can tell you that. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Uh, can we move then, please, to the second? Uh, Councillor Guglielm. Sorry, Jack, before, can I interrupt? Can I have some clarification on some of the financial implications, please? Okay. Um, the all group leaders to be entitled to receive a group leaders alliance, the estimated additional cost, sorry, the estimated additional cost is 2,300. By my reckoning, there's at least four group leaders here that would be receiving 1,000 pound plus 90 pound per member. So that would be 4,000 plus, not 2,300, and I wouldn't want to work out the exact figure. And I'd like some clarity around the introduction of the SRA for the vice chairman of the planning committee. Is that 1,500 pound on top of his 900, or is that 1,500 pound including the 900? Thank you very much. Good question. Good question, we'll get the answers. We all get in there, I promise. Okay. 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 I just nearly lost the uh, Section 151 officer there. Um, okay, thank you. Um, the reason for the for clarification is, is that um, the Section 151 officers were saying that the, that the all group uh, leaders to be entitled to receive a group leader's allowance £2,300 is the additional estimated additional cost for those under four. Um, the removal of the restriction on receiving only one SRA will pick those leaders up which were over four and therefore would be for the 5,400. In terms of the 1,500 pounds and the introduction of an SRA for the Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee, that is a total figure. Thank you. Includes the nine. Sorry, sorry, Chair, can I just make, see if I understand? So that we are now removing our previous decision that only groups of four or more were getting it and we are now going to position yes. of a gr yes. any size group. Yes. So if you refer to the recommendation, which is B, little b, you'll see that it says that all group leaders as defined by the local government committees and political groups regulations 1990 be entitled to receive the group leader's allowance and reference to opposition is removed. Therefore, that means that all group leaders, whether they are a group leader of two and above, and wherever they sit in this chamber, would be receiving a group leader's allowance. Thank you okay. for the clarification. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, uh, as the seconder, Councillor Guglielmi. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'm not going to say a huge amount, only to uh, point out that since 2009, until we sold the business in 2019, 2018, I was paying staff to free myself up to give the time here. Uh, let's not go there. It was, it was costing me money for that. Uh, we now meet once a month with my two fellow members in our ward uh, to discuss and keep on top of all the issues that come. 
never in my years as a council in tendering the workload has been as big as this. It's very easy for you guys, some of you, to take the harm oral and condemn us, how dare we, how can we sleep at night? Quite frankly, our money has not been touched for, uh, for years, quite frankly. And the thing is, I was one of the very few councillors who used to regularly spend huge amount of time to give information to the IRP and then spend equally a long amount of, money, uh, of time with the IRP sitting down and going through and never taking any notice of them. You know, there was, in Essex County Council in 2014, there was a report from the IRP which was completely rejected by the administration, yes, and there was also said the IRP were not fit for purpose. I'm not going to go as far as that, but to be honest, the amount of time that I spent putting a case together to the IRP to try to explain where my time goes has been completely ignored year after year after year. It's very easy to say, yes, you know, you're not going to be able to sleep, sleep at night because you could get yourself 8% rise. You know, to be honest, you know, the proposal that the leader is actually proposing in front of us today you know, will only reflect the amount of workload, the increased workload that we've, we've all been subjected to since, since May, the elections. And really, you know, if we want to encourage other new councillors to come forward and to actually tell them that you've got to take time off work, but you're going to get paid for a fraction of your work, maybe you're going to put people off instead of having them come in and be council, given an opportunity to. So I will be... Uh, supporting the uh, leader's motion because it's only fair and square that we do so. Thank you, Councillor Guglielmi. Councillor Stock, sum up, please. Yeah, Chairman, I'll be very brief. My motivation in moving this today was actually to make the system slightly more equitable and fair right across the chamber. Hence, I'm saying that group leaders, no matter how small the group, a group of just two members, uh, the leader should be entitled to a responsibility allowance because the role of a group leader is an incredibly important one. Even if we have a huge number of groups on this council, group leaders come to cabinet meetings, they take part in the decision making, uh, they come to group leaders meetings with the chief executive and they are a key part of, of the way that this council functions and operates and I think that should be reflected. And simply coming up with an arbitrary number of four or six or however many, some councils are, I think are up to 12. Uh, the law says a group is two or more councillors, and I think we should abide by that. Trying to define whether they're an opposition group or not is, is as we know, impossible. Um, and at the end of the day, we're still saving tens of thousands of pounds over what we were previously paying out on allowances. So, yeah, we can get all, all holier than now, but that isn't the purpose of, of my motivation behind doing this. This is about having a fair reflection of just a tiny reflection of the fact that our workload has gone up 25% and trying to make a fairer system for the special responsibility allowances and for group leaders allowances and obviously the vice, uh, vice chairman of planning and I think it's quite reasonable. Um, I'm not going to get bogged down on all the personal crap. It's not worth it. Um, I commend strongly to the council. This is a, a fair, decent thing for us to do. We're supposed to do this. We're not just supposed to blindly nod through whatever the IRP say. It's our decision as a council, our allowances. Yes, we're guided by what the IRP say um, and sometimes... We think we want to do something different. It's the first time I can remember ever doing this in the 17 years I've been a councillor, but I think it is the right thing to do at this particular juncture in time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Stock. OK. So we'll move to the vote. I have a call for a name vote. You know the form. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go for the motions. Thank you. That'll do nicely. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have sides, please. Thank please. you, gentlemen. Let's get through the evening unscathed. OK. Um, yeah. So the motion so before you will be read. The motion before you is the one as per your paper now, which is before you. I will call out your name. I will ask to for, for, against or abstain. Councillor Alexander. Four. Councillor Allen. Against. Councillor Amos. Four. Councillor Barry. Against. Councillor Bray. Four. Councillor Broderick. Councillor Bush. Councillor Calver. Councillor Casey. Councillor Chapman. Councillor Chittock. Councillor Clifton. Councillor Codling. Councillor Coley. Councillor Davidson. Councillor Davis. Councillor Fairley. Councillor Fowler. Councillor Griffiths. Councillor Carlo Gugliami. Councillor Valerie Gugliami. Councillor Harris. 
Councillor Ivan Henderson. No. Councillor Joe Henderson. No. Councillor Paul Honeywood. No. Councillor Sue Honeywood. No. Councillor King. No. Councillor Knowles. No. Councillor McWilliams. No. Councillor Miles. No. Councillor Morrison. No. Councillor Newton. No. Councillor Placey. No. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Scott. No. Councillor Skills. Councillor Steady. Okay. Councillor Gemma Stevenson. Okay. Councillor Mark Stevenson. Okay. Councillor Stock. Oh. Councillor Tolbert. Oh. Councillor Turner. Oh. Councillor White. Oh. Councillor Wiggins. Okay. And Councillor Winfield. Thank you. Gentlemen, please. please. <laughs> okay, thank you, councillors. Uh, the the, the uh, motion which was before you as per the paper, the vote was 4-23 against 20, not, not two abstentions and three not present. The motion is therefore carried. Thank you. Thank you, councillors. Moving on. Item 19, seating plan for future meetings of the council in the Princess Theatre, pages 159 to 160. They're all pretty colours. They look nice. Um, Happy to move it for noting, Chairman. Thank you. Moved. Thank you. Anyone wish to debate this or can we go straight to a vote? Fabulous. Those in favour? That looks pretty unanimous to me. Thank you. Excellent. Item 20, urgent debates. Urgent matters for debate. There are none, I believe. That is correct. Uh, item 21-22. Councillor Stock. Uh, Chairman, this is just a, a minute, but it's on blue pages, so I'm happy to move the rest of the agenda, including those blue page minutes, on block. Uh, so we don't have to exclude the press and public, but obviously if anyone wants to discuss any item, I'm happy to move the motion to exclude the press and public. Okay, to, clarif to clarify that, uh, Councillor Stock has moved uh, item 22. If anybody does wish to speak on it, we will have to clear the public gallery. Um, am I clear to go ahead and vote? Those in favour, please. Thank you, that motion is carried too. Thank you. Date of next scheduled meeting of councils, Tuesday 11th of February at 7.30. Thank you all very much tonight. Uh, it's the first time I've ever done this, so thank you very much for being kind to me. Thank you. Good night. Please be upstanding. <laughs>